I kept reading stuff about real estate and it just really, really interested me. So I got my real estate agent license and started doing some real estate brokerage stuff on the side, made some money on the side, got so consumed with that because I really liked real estate that I got fired from my job. <laughs> Hey guys and gals, this is Trevor with Carrot and uh, I was actually on another podcast recently and I had a really, really good chance to, to dive in and talk with Tom, one of our clients uh, and a huge house buyer up in Boston. We'll talk more about his business, the level of business that they're in, where they started and where they are now. But um, I was so excited by that comment. I'm like, dude, I need to get you on the podcast, on the Carrot Cast because uh, where you are now is where a lot of people want to go, but there's a lot of steps that go between starting mm -hmm. and where you are. And also, yeah. dude, I just love your story and I love how you how you uh, are tackling your business. So, so happy to have Tom Caffarella on the Carrot Cast and uh, welcome on, man. Thank you for having me. Dude, so let's, let's give a little context for people here um, mm -hmm. on your business, where you are, what, what's your family life look like, kind of where are you as a person and a business person right now to set the context? Right now, so I, I'm in a pretty good place. I mean, I've been I've been uh, in business now for over 10 years. Definitely getting entrepreneurial type personality, and um, right now we do over 100 fix and flips a year in the greater Boston market. We're pretty active. We're the biggest home buyer in the Boston market. Um, I've got a real estate brokerage of over 150 team members, and I've got a pretty big rental property portfolio. So. For the first time since I really started my business, I kind of feel like, okay, I'm, I'm not that I'm where I want to be because I always want to take another step up, but like I feel like, okay, I'm kind of here now, yeah. right now. Dude, and, and I want to dive into that a little bit because there's a lot of psychology that goes into um, high achievers and being happy and, and just happiness, right? So, I want, dude, I want to dig into that a little bit because that's something that I think we all I get struggle a, I get with. A, I get to work on the happiness. I'm, yeah. I'm very insatiable on that <laughs> front. So, it's like, um, yeah, I could probably use some therapy sessions. <laughs> dude, I'm, I'm going to pop in the mail a, a book for you that a really good friend of mine, uh, Seth Bueckley, wrote called Ambition. And yeah. uh, he was on the Carrot Cast, you know, probably in the first 20 episodes. Anyway, he works here in my office building and uh, he's grown two companies well in the tens of millions. His last one did about 60 million in revenue and just sold it. And uh, he wrote a book on exactly how he has dealt with ambition and happiness and things like that, dude. It's really good. So we'll pop one in the mail to you. Yeah, thank you. Seriously, it's good, dude. So, and everyone else who's listening to the Carrot Cast or watching this on YouTube, head back to our archives and look up that episode with Seth Buechlin. If you ever have that struggle of ambition and achievement and happiness and contentment, uh, his book breaks it down really, really well with some awesome, awesome stuff. So I love it. Um, dude, so I kind of want to want to roll back to to the start. So we kind of know where you are now. You're you have you have a pretty big business. You're doing 100 plus fix and flips a year. Largest mm -hmm. home buyer in Boston. Um, mm -hmm. it sounds like you've got a really, really stable business right now at this point. Yep. Uh, I see some pictures behind you. Um, are you are you married? And I can't tell if that's a a child or no, that's your puppy, dude. I see a puppy. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I could I could probably update the pictures in here. So I just had my I just had my third kid on Friday. Cool. cool. So I've got I've got three kids. I've got a four year old daughter. Of of course I'm uh, like you see in the background there. I'm married. I've been I've been married for for seven years now, awesome. and I've got three kids. A four year old daughter who just started preschool uh, two weeks ago. I've got a one year old son, and then a newborn. They just came on Friday. Congrats, man! That's so cool. We've got three kids too, and it's I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's not easy, dude. Especially it's when not easy. It's not easy. But you know what? I don't do a lot outside of work, mm -hmm. so that's my fun right there. That's cool. so. I love it, dude. So yeah. let's let's spin back to the start. So you've got a successful business now. Where did you start? When was that start for you in real estate? What did you do before before that? Well. Uh, to go back to the original start, so so I grew up poor, right? I had no money growing up. So, you know, from the early onset, I knew that I wanted to be in a good financial position because I knew, I saw firsthand kind of how not being in a good financial position, you know, impacted my parents mm -hmm. and my family in general. So I said, I'm, I'm never going to let that happen. So, so growing up, I thought education was the way out. So I got straight A's my whole life. Like, you know, I hate school. I hate school more than anything. 
but I, I became a good student because I had to, because I felt that that was the way that it was going to take me out of my current situation. Mm-hmm. So I was pre-med in college and, you know, again, doing very well, you know, thinking about heading off to med school. And I, I hated that. Um, but I, I was doing it because I thought this is the way to make a lot of money. And as I was going along through the process of getting into med school, I started reading all these books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and things like that, that really opened my mind to say, man, um, you don't have to do what society tells you to do like step by step. Like there's other ways to make money that are a little bit more unconventional. Mm-hmm. And so it was at that point, this is after I did everything to get into med school that I decided – I really wanted to be in business. So my easiest transition was to double major. And so I had a biochem major and then I double majored as an accountant. And um, I went right in 2005 when Sarbanes-Oxley hit, which was a a accounting regulation uh, from the Enron scandal that happened in about 2003. Mm The, the, the job market was on fire for accountants. So I started working at a, a big, big firm right out of college in Boston. And basically the first day that I got to my desk, I was like, man, I can't do this. And I tell people and, you know, people say, no, no way. But I felt like it was worse than jail mm-hmm. because at least in jail, you could sit there and maybe read a book of something that interests you. But I was chained to my desk for 12 hours a day doing something that I absolutely hated. Yeah. And so almost immediately once I got there, even though I had a good job and I had tons of, you know, uh, future potential there, I said, I got to find a way out. And so I, I kept reading books and reading books and I said, you know, I kept reading stuff about real estate and it just really, really interested me. So I got my real estate agent license and started doing some real estate brokerage stuff on the side, made some money on the side, got so consumed with that because I really liked real estate that I got fired from my job. <laughs> and this was quite literally about 10 years ago to the day, I think I got fired in December of 2007. So almost 10 years ago. And so I was 25 at the time, thought my life was over, thought I was a failure, um, was embarrassed to tell my friends and family and parents. And I was just like, man, you know, for somebody that had always been a high achiever to get fired from their job, it didn't add up. Mm -hmm. So, um, I made the conscious decision that at 25 years old, this was the time to build a business Hmm. because I didn't have kids. I wasn't married. I I had, my wife was, we were, we were going out, but uh, I was still living at home with my parents. I didn't have any bills. Hmm. And at the time, looking back, I thought it was a huge risk. But now as of today, I'm like, man, you know, there was no risk there. I had no bills. I had nobody to take care of. But at the time I, it seemed scary to me. So um, I started as a real estate agent, just helping people buy and sell homes. And then one day I came across a seller who wanted to sell to an investor. They didn't want to list with me and they were willing to take a super low offer, but they didn't want to list. Long story short, I ended up buying the property, um, wholesaling it, making a ton of money. And after that, I was like, because again, to go back to like the very beginning, my whole goal was like, how do I get myself into a good financial position? Yeah. And right when I realized that you can make a ton of money in real estate and I loved it, the light bulb went off. And then from there on out, like the next 10 years was all about building that business. Dude, so there's a couple of things I want to unpack there for everyone because you know, whether you're just starting as an entrepreneur or you're someone who's been in business for a long time, there's, there's certain psychological or, or psychology steps in mindset steps we've got to get over. And, um, Dude, there's probably a lot of your friends, my guess is that they took jobs like you did that you were miserable, but they chose to stay and you didn't. And what, yeah. what, do, you, what do you feel is the difference? Like what, what is the difference on, on what triggered in your brain versus in our friends who don't make that leap? There's two things. The first thing is that I was so miserable. Mm-hmm. So when I was sitting there working for somebody else, I'm so entrepreneurial to a fault. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's a fault, but it's just, yeah. It's just it's hard for me to not look to find the best way to do things. And if I'm working at a company that doesn't give me that flexibility, it's just painful for me. Mm -hmm. So it was really frustrating and I really hated my life. So that was the first part. And the second part was just my belief in myself that I could do it. 
And I, I'm not going to lie. There were many times along the way where I said to myself, maybe I'm making the wrong decision. But at the end of the day, I knew that other people were doing it and that I was willing, you know, so I talked about getting good grades. I don't want to make people misunderstand me. Mm-hmm. I'm not smarter than anybody else. I work harder. I, yep. I got A's because I worked hard. And I, I built this business because instead of working 40 hours a week, I worked 100 hours a week. Mm-hmm. And so I, w- I knew that if other people could do it, it doesn't matter if I had an advantage or a disadvantage in the beginning, I would outwork them. Mm-hmm. So I knew that I was willing to put in that effort. Dude, and, and you mentioned risk earlier, right? I, I did a, a podcast on this recently where a friend of mine, he, uh, you know, he's six, seven years younger. I, I'm 35. It sounds like you're about the same. I just turned 35. I'm 35 too. Yeah. And, uh, and he's like, man, it looks like you have some sort of level of success. And how did you get there? Like, what was the one thing that, that you did to get there? And of course, there's not just one thing. But the first thing there from, is, there is one thing. What, what is it? Work hard. There you go. <laughs> did, right. Let me ask you this. Did you, yeah. did you work hard? Oh yeah. Big time, big time. And that, yeah. you know, it's not just that, but like that, that is like, you know, you put in more than a 40 hour work week, right? Yep. Yep. For a long time. Right. Oh, big time. Yep. What's that? What's that book? Um, Malcolm Gladwell, um, outliers. Is it? Yeah. I, maybe, that might not even be the right book, but there's, he has a book there it says essentially to be really, really good at something. He, he analyzed all the, the top, you know, in, in every category of life. And there's a certain amount of hours. I think it's, it might be 10,000 hours. I could be way off on the That's number it. of hours. Yeah. Is it 10,000? Yeah. yeah. So, so he's analyzed the best in every single category. And what he found was that there was never an instance where somebody put in less than 10,000 hours. Mm-hmm. Right. And my, my guess is you put in those 10,000 hours. Oh man. I, I remember when we were, <laughs> living up in Portland and I was doing consulting on the side during, during the, the eight hours to try to pay rent and stuff like that. Not even knowing what I was doing, doing some real estate. And then I'd get home at, you know, six o'clock. I'd go up there and do half hour of, of uh, just hitting the ball around at the golf range. Cause it was just up the street from us. Cause I had to get some physical activity in and then I'd come and work the rest of the night. You know, after dinner, my wife would go study for her. She, she's in medical. She would go study and I'd work until one or two in the morning. Like that was hmm. my, that was my couple, couple of years that year. And for me, it was just normal because I was excited about what I was doing. And like you were saying, I was wanting to get away from the current situation I had and and toward a situation that seemed like it'd be better. And the mm. only way out of that was, like you said, putting in the hours, man, and getting to work doing it. So Yeah, every everybody always asks me, you know, like typically when people ask that question, what's the one thing, mm-hmm. they're looking for a shortcut. Oh, big time. And, and, yep. and, and I, I just blow people out of the water. I'm like, what you're looking for is the exact opposite of what it is, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's like it, you got to put in those hours. I mean, you talk to a bunch of people. Have you ever found somebody that didn't put in the hours that were super successful? Nope. Nope. So, yeah. I Dude, I, I love it. <laughs> If, if you if you if you find that person, let me know because I that, you know we we need we need to capitalize on that exactly. No, and, and there probably is that person out there somewhere that of just had, had this crazy idea and then of whatever course. happened. But yeah, in general, not in general. The rule is you got to put in the hours and kind of go back to that risk thing. Uh, you mentioned shoot. You know, I thought when I was doing this that that was risky, but later I realized that it wasn't risky. And that was no. the first thing that I had to do is I had to flip my risk profile. Where I think most other people, um, they look at risk as in, oh my gosh, what's going to happen if I do this? You know, and, <laughs> and I think we look at it as, man, what will happen if I don't do this? Like, what am I guaranteed? To, to have my life look like if I do not take this step and if I do not take that leap. And you took the leap, dude, put in the work and, uh, and built a great business, which I love. So yeah. on the risk side, have you changed your risk um, threshold now? Like, are you still taking big risks or is just risk is not something you even look at now? Well, you know, risk, risk is an interesting phrase, right? Mm-hmm. Because risk kind of implies that you're doing something and there's a chance that something bad can happen. Yeah. So what I, what I look at risk is like, you know, you go to the casino, you put all your money on black and you've got whatever, a 49 or 48 percent chance of of winning. Mm-hmm. So the way I look at risk now is like I do things where I've got a 90 percent chance of winning. Yes, there is that 10 percent, you know, failure possibility. But like I've, I keep pushing all my chips into these high probability things. Mm-hmm. So I guess. I don't think there's any way to, there's no way to completely eliminate risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're talking about financial risk, like you work for somebody else, you could get fired. Mm -hmm. You start your own business, 
the market could crash or your market could be taken away from you. So there is no way to get to that 100% no risk, um, but we, we want to get the risk down as low as possible and focus our efforts on the things that are going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. Mm-hmm. And, and it's also kind of digging into the risk thing. I think the biggest thing when people feel something is risky is they don't understand it well enough. You know, they, they don't understand that's that the topic thing. well that, enough. They don't, and, and that that's something you get with experience. Mm-hmm. So I will tell you, like looking back on some things, I thought some things were not risky at all, and they were. And sometimes now I look at things and um, I think that they – aren't risky and you know you get better at analyzing what's mm-hmm. risky and what's not and and you get that sense as you you know grow your business dude so i, I want to kind of go back to you, you got that first deal done you got is a big wholesale deal you were doing some some listings and in, in, in brokerage like normal real estate agent stuff they did this wholesale deal so yes. that kind of opened up the, the the investing side of things what happened next dude so did you go back to the normal agent stuff and then another deal came came by or did you directly jump into going okay how can i find more of these wholesale deals and what do those look like and how do i find them so i i i made one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars on my first wholesale so mm-hmm. i didn't flip it i wholesaled it and made one hundred and fifteen thousand, which is not normal i made a ridiculous amount on that wholesale deal and it was you know looking back on it it was luck Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't know it at the time. So I thought that that was kind of normal. And I said, well, man, how can I replicate this? And at that given point in time, I had no idea how to do that. So what I ended up doing was franchising with a company called Homevestors. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yep. Yeah, uh, totally. Yes. So they're the, I believe they're the only uh, investing, home investing franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I franchised with them and they basically had a model um a marketing model where you could basically predict and and spend marketing dollars and get leads and do all that so i i I signed on with them kind of got my bearings like i learned a lot from working with them like there were pros and cons of of franchising and um you know i did pretty well but what i kept seeing again being the entrepreneurial person that i am it's hard for me to work under the confines of somebody else's systems because i look at the system and i say I can make that system better. And so when 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 we had the opportunity to renew our contract, we didn't do it. And once we kind of had the confines taken away from us, our business exploded because we figured out how to do things better. Hmm. Dude, so what were a couple of those? Let's break it down. What were a couple of those things that that you noticed that you guys could do better that you did that then kind of put the afterburners to your business? Number one was marketing. Okay. So so they have a system where you pay into a monthly marketing budget and then they spit you out leads, mm-hmm. which is really cool because I guess you don't have to figure out the marketing piece on your own. Yeah. But what we what we came to find is that we could do it better. So if if their cost per lead and I'm just throwing out random numbers, if their cost per lead was two hundred dollars, we could get our leads to a hundred dollars. Mm. And so once we figured out that we could get them cheaper and better then it just accelerated our business because in real estate investing, it's a marketing business. People, when they first get into it, think HGTV, it's all about renovating the property, but it actually has nothing to do with that at all. In fact, I don't even go into any properties anymore. Mm -hmm. It's all about marketing, getting face to face with motivated sellers and finding the right person in the right situation that it makes sense for that seller to take a cash offer. Mm -hmm. You buy it and that's where the money's made. Dude, so on, on the marketing side, I've said this many, many times. I'm not the first and only person. I think it's something that, you know, great marketers and great marketing teachers have said this. But, you know, look at whatever business you're in and you're in the marketing business. You just happen to be, you know, selling a, a product that's real estate. So before you guys left Homevestors, did you ever dive in and, and study marketing? And, and when, when did you start to become a student of marketing to where you're always looking at marketing? Because you had to so- make that switch somewhere. Yeah, I I know exactly what it was. So, um, yeah, so what ended up happening was we went to a a Fortune Builders three-day seminar. Uh Before we went to the three days, because our business was kind of struggling at that time, and they came around to a local RIA, a Boston RIA, and they said, hey, we're having this three-day event. I forget what it was. It was a couple grand. And we were like, man, we got to, you know, tune up our business. And the, the problem that we had was really that we were relying on the franchise to make us successful. Mm -hmm. 
And so we weren't thinking about marketing ourselves and we weren't thinking about how to make our systems better. We were just trying to follow their exact system. And again, their their exact system was better than the no system that we had before. Mm-hmm. But once we get, we went to this three day boot camp, we were like, oh man, like we can do marketing on our own. <laughs> And it sounds it it sounds really stupid, like you know, looking back on it. But but really, we just relied on them. We would say, hey, we pay three thousand dollars a month into marketing. These are the leads we get. We have no control over anything, yeah. and we were getting leads in areas that we didn't even want to buy houses in, mm-hmm. because they were marketing to places we didn't want to buy houses because they were basically servicing all of the franchisees in their system. Gotcha. So, um, so yeah, that's when the light bulb went off and, um, it actually started out with, uh, an SEO product that we bought. Um, and we started making single page property websites for, you know, specific cities. And we just, from that point on with marketing, we just kept testing and, and scaling up what was working. Mm -hmm. So we did, we tried a whole bunch of things all in a very short window of time and figured out what worked and then spent more money on the areas that worked the best. And and for everyone listening to this, so first of all, you know, Tom um, has his company, Ocean City Development, which is the investment business. Um, you have your brokerage side. I'm not sure if, if it's a different name or the same, but you have your brokerage side. And now yeah. you've got a training side as well. So uh, this isn't something where we're coming like, hey, we're going to pitch Tom's coaching or whatever. But completely, if you guys love what, what um, Tom's saying, you want to learn what they're doing. Where can people find out about you, Tom, and what you guys are doing, your podcast, stuff like that? Yeah, the best way to, to find out more about what we're doing is to go to the URL, www.realestateinvestingiseasy.com. Mm-hmm. And what it is, it's a, it's a 40 minute training video on our partnership program and how people can work with us one on one. So, what, what happened to me at the end of December of 2016 is we spend a ton of money on marketing in Boston, well over a million dollars a year. The problem I had is that we literally ran out of people to, to market to. Yep. So I, I'm working with you now on some SEO stuff and uh, other things, but but even still, I'm pretty much tapped out on what I can spend on marketing in, in my area because I'm reaching so many people. Mm-hmm. So my first in- instinct at the end of 2016 was, let's go into a different market. Let's go into New Jersey or New York or somewhere else where we can basically replicate our model. Mm-hmm. But like we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, I've got three kids that are really, really young. I can't travel. My partners get a couple of young kids, both under the age of three years old. So we can't realistically do it. So what we decided to do was to create this partnership program to give people literally the exact same systems and lead generation tools in their market so that they could generate leads and we can coach them on converting uh, these leads into money on the investing side. So that's what we've been, I've been pretty focused on that for the past nine months only because I have gotten my Boston based business pretty under control without heavy involvement from me. Dude, that's so sweet. So you mentioned you mentioned this big number, a million bucks a year is what you guys are putting into marketing right now. Uh, mm-hmm. You started off, of course, a lot a lot smaller. So what I want to do the rest of this episode of the Carrot Cast is yes. in a competitive market, um, a lot of people have a, have a tougher time marketing, right? Because they have yes. to figure out their marketing systems and things like that. So if you're cool with it, let's let's use the rest of this Carrot Cast to dive into marketing. And yes. um, if you guys want to learn more and, and see what, what Tom's doing, head over to, was it realestateinvestingiseasy.com? Yes. Sweet. Cool. So head over there. So let's go back to, to you guys went to the Fortune Builders Bootcamp. You mm-hmm. it opened up your mind that you guys can do marketing. You didn't renew your, your contract with uh, the franchise. And mm-hmm. what did you guys start to do from there? So you now went, okay, I have this money that now instead of paying into this this franchise, I can now put somewhere. What did you guys test? What worked? What didn't work? What did you Ooh. what did you go all in on scaling things up? We tested everything. So so if you Google search like real estate marketing um, uh, strategies, we we tested every single one of them from banding signs to mailers to cold calling to SEO to PPC to um, you know banner ads. Mm-hmm. So there's there's nothing that we quite literally there's nothing we haven't tried and we still uh, billboards um, we, and this stuff that we still test and try today. Like if you tell me right now after we we get off, oh, there's this one other thing that just came out, like I'll try it. So we tried everything, but there's only a few things that work. So um, the things that work really well. So um, first of all, 
like it depends on what your marketing budget is. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a marketing budget, there's really only three things that I would do, which is SEO with you guys, Mm -hmm. right? Because you guys train people how to do SEO without spending a lot of money, right? Yep. Okay, so there's SEO with you, there's cold calling, which you can do completely almost for free, Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's bandy signs. Um, and door knocking, I guess, but a lot of people don't use door knocking, but those are the four kind of free things, but I don't really, I don't personally really like the free stuff as of, you know, September of 2017 for me, because I have a lot of money and I don't have a lot of time. Yep. So I, I always look at it like right now, like what can I do to generate leads by spending money? Because that I can just spend as much as I want and get return on my investment. Mm -hmm. So What's working for us the best right now, and it's not even close, is Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. And you saw that in in the back of my account, like from just, you know, practically every single lead that's coming in through the carrot site that I have with you is on Facebook. Um, Google pay-per-click works, but it's it's getting so expensive. Um, Mailers work, but everyone else is doing them. And cold calling works. Mm -hmm. And those those are the ones that that we've seen that are getting the best ROI, but like as of today, Facebook is doing the best. Dude, so so you mentioned, and, and to put this out there, so you mentioned, of course, that you're using Carrot, and yeah. uh, you, you moved over to Carrot some time ago, you're using us for for that, I'm looking in the back of your account right now, and and I mean, and this this isn't normal, y'all, so anyone who's like saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm gonna expect 116 leads this week, like I see in Tom's account. Yeah. Um, and some of those are step two leads, of course. So in actuality, it might be, let's say, 75 leads. And then there's some step two, step two leads and whatever. But there's nobody a lot of fills leads. Out, nobody fills out step two. It's like, it probably, probably is like 100 that are, it's probably 100 leads. Nobody yeah. likes that. Everyone gets caught on step one. Yeah. And, and, and it really depends on your lead source, too, right? So if you're looking at SEO yeah. or PPC, your step two um, qualification form gets filled out a lot more. More. So we'll look at the stats oh, there, it? and it's upwards of seventy percent. I end up filling out step two. So it's it's you start to look at the psychology of where the person's coming from. You know, if yeah. if someone's going to a Google search and they type in "sell my house fast Boston" or something like that, or how do I sell an inherited house in Boston? They're actually they have an intent of looking for a solution to sell. So then they they tend to follow through with it more. Um, I see. On the Facebook side, you know, they're browsing, they're looking at cat pictures, they're looking at what their friend ate that day, and oh man, this thing popped in my way. And I'm going to click it and then do that. And then their attention goes back to Facebook. So there's psychology dynamics there. But still, dude, you're generating a lot of leads. And mm-hmm. um, Facebook isn't the easiest when it comes to sellers. And you guys, it seems like you guys have cracked something that's working on the seller side. And mm-hmm. whatever you're comfortable sharing, share. But um, what types of things on Facebook are working? Because the last thing I want people to do after listening to this is go, oh my gosh, I'm going to go flip on Facebook ads and put a bunch of crappy ads up that aren't strategic and drive a, you know, put a bunch of money in there. And then they end up losing mm-hmm. their thousand bucks that month because we said Facebook ads when they didn't, maybe they aren't mm-hmm. setting the ads up right. Maybe, you know, that kind you're, of you're a hundred percent right on Facebook ads. So Facebook ads are a lot different than the other forms of marketing. Yep. So like comparing that to mailers, like, most people use almost the same exact mailer and yeah, you can get a little bit conversion if your mail is a little bit better, but you know, I talk to a lot of people across the country and we almost all kind of get the same results. Mm -hmm. Facebook ads are totally different because the way that Facebook works, so Facebook make makes money because people are on Facebook all day long, right? So Facebook has this captive audience where eyeballs are looking quite literally like every single second of every single day. Mm -hmm. So the worst thing for Facebook is if people stop using it. And so the, 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 the reason why Facebook ads are so different is that when the Facebook ad comes through your newsfeed, if you click that you don't wanna see it anymore, Facebook then basically discredits that ad and it will show it less. Mm. And they call that your relevancy score. So if your relevancy score, they rate it on a scale of one to 10. If your relevancy score is a 10, you're gonna get a way lower cost per lead, meaning quite literally like a third a cost per lead than what it would be if it was a one. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that the ad that you put up is quote unquote relevant to the audience that you're serving it to. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that it's not 
um, something that people kind of view as spammy, I guess is the right way to put it. So it has to really ca- catch the attention of the specific person and not be an annoying ad. Mm. So it has to look cr- clean. It has to look crisp. It has to say the right things. It has to, the more it can speak to your particular audience, the better. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that's important about it is putting it out in front of the right people. So Facebook is crazy in terms of how you can split up like who things go to. Have you run a lot of Facebook ads? Yep. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, so so what you can see on the back end, Facebook knows everything about us, bottom line. So first of all, everything that we put into Facebook, just based on what we put in alone is crazy. But um, then what they do, um, what is that phrase called? Uh, uh, where they, they add data to the data that they, they append data. Yep. So what they do is like, they'll put in, you'll put in your contact information. So you, they already have your email. They already have your phone number. They already know where you work. They already know what city you live in. And then they append that data to other data providers saying, where do you live? Are you a homeowner? Are you a renter? So it's super important that if you're trying to buy a house from somebody that you're not putting ads up in front of a renter mm-hmm. because a renter is automatically just going to knock that down. You want to make sure you're not putting it in front of a real estate agent because a real estate agent isn't going to be your, your target demographic. Mm-hmm. You're going to want to make sure that you put it in front of people in the right age group mm-hmm. because guys like us, 35 year old guys, we really don't sell to investors. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe one in a million do, but very, very few do. Yep. So it's really important that you get your demographics down and you get, you're, you're showing your ads to the right people and they're not getting annoyed. Mm-hmm. But the cool thing about Facebook is Facebook basically allows you to keep trying and testing and trying and testing and trying and testing. So your first ad is probably going to suck, but you can continuously test and then you'll be able to see within a very short window of time if your ad is getting better. So if you start off with a relevancy score of three and then you try a different picture or you try different verbiage and now it's a six, okay, you're heading in the right direction, but you always want to push towards getting towards that 10. And so like when we work with people out of state, one of the the most value add things that they get is they're going to get these leads at a really low cost. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a coaching program on how to do things, but they're actually going to get leads in their market. And so by working with us alone, just on the media side, like just on the the marketing side, they're going to get if they're going to pay one hundred and twenty dollars for a lead, they're going to pay eighty dollars with me because I've gotten that algorithm down. Dude, and, and same thing. I'm looking inside the, the back of your carrot account, and and I want to talk about the carrot side of it in a little bit because you have a big which, business. Oh, yeah, go which for by it. the way is hugely, hugely important. I should have mentioned that. So, if you are dropping people to a garbage website, and and garbage is probably the wrong word. I I, I when you were on my podcast, I was telling my audience. It's about a site that converts. Mm -hmm. So like if I was to run Facebook ads, if someone said to me, Tom, I want you to manage my Facebook ad account, but I want to drop it to this non-carrot site, I would actually not do it because I'm serious. I I wouldn't do it because they're not going to get the results Mm -hmm. because you need a site that converts. And what what I did before I was was a carrot client, I used to drop all this traffic to my site and the problem is, is that if they go, they get onto a site where there's not a clear call to action, where the wording is not perfect, they're not going to fill out the form. And obviously, if they don't fill out the form, we don't get the lead. Yep. So um, it's really important that you're dropping it to a carrot site because you guys have split tested all of the different variations and what works and what doesn't. And believe me when I tell you, you, th- you could think you know what you're talking about on the marketing side. But until you split test something, you're going to be wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. you're, you're going to guess that, that the way that like, if I were to guess, and like I told you on my podcast, I look at my carrot site and I'm like, there's nothing special about it. Mm-hmm. But there is when I look at the difference between what the traffic was doing when they went to my site, which I thought looked prettier versus going to your site, which I thought was just, you know, an okay looking site. Yeah. People were just filling out the form, and we don't care about anything else other than getting their contact information. Mm-hmm. And dude, I'm, I'm, there's a couple other things on the Facebook side. So I'm, I'm in the back end of your carrot site, and we've made a lot of upgrades, of course, to stats and the lead lead data and stuff like that. And one of the upgrades we made a couple of weeks ago was showing more more traffic source data between, behind your your stuff. So I'm not going to give any lead source information or anything like that. But 72 percent of your traffic is mobile which is obvious uh-huh. because it's a lot of it's from Facebook, right? And that's another mm-hmm. thing that a lot of people aren't looking at is 
depending on your your marketing source, you could heavily you could heavily have a, a, a traffic source that's viewing it on their cell phones or their desktop. Either way, depending on how they found out about you. And if your website isn't amazing on mobile, which yes. your previous one wasn't, your previous you one know, wasn't. I bet that was my. I you know if I had to bet, I bet that was the problem before, mm-hmm. because I don't think my site was was optimized to to really convert on on mobile Mm -hmm. because my site didn't really look that much different on desktop but like you just people that are on facebook are on their phones i i I mean for the most part when i run the facebook ads i run them to desktop and mobile but like you see 75 percent of the traffic is coming mobile Mm -hmm. and it's such a big deal because on the mobile device with, with the other site like like you mentioned it was when you guys custom built it was pretty it looked great um, but on that one, someone had to scroll down four or five scrolls to get to a really good clear call to action. Even that clear call to action wasn't easy on mobile. And that's something we t- we test our mobile designs as much, if not more, than we test our desktop designs because we see that's not where things are heading. In many marketing uh, sources, that's where things already are. Mm, and yeah. uh, so you've got to make sure to nail that stuff. So, um, so you guys have ramped up Facebook ads. I'm assuming you guys already have a bunch of offline stuff. Are you guys doing direct mail and stuff like that? We have a direct mail, like we, we have a full-time person that works our direct mail center. Okay. So we, we spent a ton of money on machines and stuff like that. And we've got a really good mailing operation. Um, it's just that mailing's oversaturated right now mm. and, you know, in every market. So if you're in an okay competitive market, maybe that person's getting two or three letters. If you're in a market like San Francisco, you go there and you've got 45 people that are stacked up. Yeah. So it's a problem because as investors, we need to be where there's less competition. Mm-hmm. So when you've got 45 different people that you're competing with, it's not that much better than being on the MLS, mm-hmm. which is why I love Facebook because Facebook is just right there. It's in front of them and they click a button and we've got their contact info. And it's also why I love cold calling in this market too, because you can cold call and say, hey, do you get my letter? And even if you didn't send the letter out, they're going to be like, yeah, I got your letter because you know they're getting you know they're getting letters. So if if you're trying to do this business on a zero budget and you're just calling through, you're going to get a a, a ton of responses because nobody else is cold calling. Dude, where where are you guys getting your list for cold calls? Like what kind of list are you guys calling? Um, So the way that we do it in Boston is we make a database on all we start with what we want to buy. So we make a database and we say these are all the specific information about the types of homes we want to buy, the cities. um, Obviously, the mortgage balance is hugely important, Mm -hmm. um, the the age of the homeowner, how old the home is, all that kind of stuff. And so we build a database around there and that's who we focus on. That's who we contact. Like when we're on Facebook, you can upload those addresses Mm -hmm. and show ads to only those people. So I'm making sure that my ads are getting in front of the right people. So we're hitting those people over and over and over again. And, and as far as where where are you getting that information to build the database? Are you getting it from list source or a bunch of different other list aggregators? Or are you guys just hustling like with the county courthouse looking for data there? So we started by building the database out of our uh, public recording MLS. Mm-hmm. And I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, but now for the people that I work with out of state, there's a lot of shortcuts. List source is good, but they're kind of expensive. Yeah. The the program that I like for a lot of people that are just getting into this that isn't too cheap, but you know it's cheaper is um, Find Motivated Sellers Now by Kent Clothier. Have oh, yeah. you used that? Oh yeah, dude. I'm good good friends with Kent, and lot, lots of our clients use it too, for sure. He's. I, I mean, it's an. I mean, it's it's list source, but at mm. A fraction of the cost mm-hmm. and actually it's better than list source because you get a bunch of other freebies too i don't use the other freebies but uh for, for i think he charges now maybe 99 bucks a month mm-hmm. i mean you can generate these lists really really quickly yep. um so yeah he, he's got a great product there sweet i love it and and to find that resource guys and gals there might be a link somewhere around this or just go to find motivated sellers now i'm sure you can find it on google Oh, yeah. sweet. So kind of looking at the overall marketing stuff, you guys, you guys have tried everything. You, you mentioned mm-hmm. some, some free methods where if someone just doesn't have the budget, 
Um, but mm-hmm. they've got the time. They can go out there and nail it. And that's one thing that we always look at when we're working with our clients is, okay, what's your goal and then what's your budget, both time and money budget? And if their time budget is is greater than their money budget, do the things that you mentioned. If you've got some money, you can accelerate things and um, and start to spit out. Basically, put in a dollar and get out a dollar times X. And there's a quote behind you on in your office, man. And I'm always like, I always love seeing the environments that people work in. And I see your whiteboard there. I see your your family back there and a quote back there. You can probably you read have, it. I I read the quote, man. So the quote says, "Ultimately, the business that can spend the most to acquire a customer wins." And we, we talked about this a little bit on your on your podcast, but dude, why don't you kind of break that down for everyone listening to this? Why is that quote so important you put it on your wall and what's it mean to you and your business? It's hugely important. So at the end of the day, we're, we're all in competition with each other. Like everybody in my Boston market is in competition with the sellers that are gonna be selling their property. So ultimately what it means is that if, if I can make more off of a lead than somebody else, I can pay more to acquire that customer. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, what that, what that means for me in my investment business is how I've merged my brokerage model with my investment model. Mm -hmm. So I spent over a million dollars last year on marketing, but I got back over well over a million dollars just in listings. So when we go out and we meet with the seller, we give them two options. We say, here's your fast cash offer. Um, if you want a fast cash offer, Here's what you need to do if you want to get get top dollar for your property, and these are the steps to go through it. So what it means for me is that because I made more back than I spent just on the listing side alone, I have an unlimited marketing budget. Mm -hmm. So because my competitors don't do this, I can spend more than them and make more money. And so, and, and the other thing that it means is like if we're competing for a sa- the same you know phrase on on Google or if we're mailing on on Google, I can spend more money, and on mailing, I can mail more people, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, you got to figure out how to squeeze as much money out of each lead as you possibly can, mm-hmm. and and that doesn't just go to like the brokerage side, but also like we've got a database now of old leads and I'm sure a lot of the carrot customers have a database. Don't sleep on those old leads. Like you want that person. This is human nature, right? Somebody fills out a form on your carrot site. You want them to sell the property to you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That person very well, uh, well might not be ready to sell their property for another year, another two years, another three years. So you've got to work your old leads. And the way that we do that is we use a three-line dialer called Mojo Dialer. Mm-hmm. We keep in contact with all of our old leads because we know that there's a lot of people who aren't ready right then and there. And the, you know, a lot of the people that I work with that um, are out of state that I'm partnering with, you know, that's one of the biggest frustrations. And I guarantee that you get it too. Like oh, someone, someone fell out of form, but they're not selling for six months. Mm-hmm. Like we want them to sell now, but I mean, you know, the seller is gonna do what's ever in their best interest. And if it's six months, it's six months, but you better be ready to follow up in six months. You better have a good CRM and you better have a good follow-up system or else you're not gonna maximize that that marketing dollar. And dude, a lot of people, especially newer investors, but a lot of people have a short-term mindset. And oh yeah, you know, the, the thing that you mentioned there, that seller not gonna be ready for six months, well, you're gonna need leads in six months also. So make sure to build, oh, that, yeah. build that darn pipeline and think long-term. And uh, the way that we always talk about it here at Carrot is you've got your short-term traffic and leads and you've got mo- your momentum builders and follow up as a big momentum builder because you get that follow up happening and you're gonna start to build that momentum. It's gonna stack up over the months. You know, your SEO, refining your your paid campaigns, all those things stack like bricks and and build a Mm -hmm. wall versus being these individual bricks that you use and then kind of toss out there. You need to stack those bricks so they form this wall so it starts bouncing all that stuff back for you. And uh, so to build that momentum is so, so awesome. Um, dude, man, there's, I I could talk another hour on this, on this podcast and we may have you back for another session, but, um, is there anything else on the marketing side that you just got to get out uh, to people listening to this, uh, before we, before we wrap it? Well, I mean, that would be depending upon who we're talking to because everyone's at different stages. But I think the, the overall thing is you need to market every single month. We're in a marketing business you can never stop marketing for deals. The second that you stop marketing for deals is the second that you're gonna go out of business mm-hmm. and it needs to be consistent. Um, like I said, if if it's gonna be free, fine, then you need to set aside so many hours a week to do your, your, your prospecting. If it's not free, 
you can't up and down your marketing budget. It's mm-hmm. gotta be consistent. And actually, you want to increase it over time. Like you want to start and say, I'm gonna to commit to X, and maybe that's a thousand dollars a month or maybe even five hundred dollars a month to start. But your goal should be to make enough money so that that five hundred dollars a month can turn into five thousand, can turn into fifty thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, but you've got to do it consistently, and you can't expect to convert. You can't expect to spend five hundred dollars a month and get you know a deal every single month, right? So you've got to be patient. You've got to keep keep spending and and just keep grinding and working your your ass off. Like mm-hmm. you said about stacking stacking everything. This is. This is building a business, right? This isn't a get rich quick scheme. You can get rich, but you've got to build the business. Like yeah. the money comes once you've got the skills. Mm-hmm. It doesn't it doesn't come once you start. Dude, that's a really, really great way to say it. So the last few minutes here, I'm gonna be completely shameless in this last few minutes, because one of the things that I that I just makes me smile, we get these text messages every day, we get these emails every day. And when you and I were talking on your podcast, um, it just made me smile because it, it's it's really awesome and fun when you've worked your butt off building a business and you hear your clients are getting great results Mm -hmm. and and you come out and and you told me about the results you're getting and and why you switched over to care i didn't ask you for that you just like Mm -hmm. felt you wanted to i'm like man that right there fires me up and it fires our team up so really quickly here on the carrot side of things so you were using um a custom developed website before yeah um and then can you kind of briefly tell people who are listening to this why you chose to make this switch? You were hearing other people talking about it. Uh, I just kept hearing about you guys. It was like crazy. And because I I work with a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people, I have a mm-hmm. podcast, you know, they're like, oh, you know, we just, we always ask each other, like, what are you doing? What's working for you, right? So I just kept hearing, you know, you know, your name over and over again. And, and I'll be completely honest, like mm-hmm. the first 10 times I heard it, I was like, I've got a good website. Yep. And then I, you know, it comes down to like trial and error stuff. I just said, you know what, for a hundred bucks a month, why would I not just try, you know, test it, Mm -hmm. compare it to, compare it to what I'm doing right now and just see what happens. And then I did it and my leads more than doubled. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize it at the time, but I had a broken website and it wasn't broken in that it looked ugly. It was broken in that it didn't convert traffic. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just started using you guys and, and just by literally just switching it, you know, it more than doubled my leads mm-hmm. and I spend a lot of money on marketing. So it's a huge deal, you know, to, you know, if I'm, if I'm getting $200 leads and then all of a sudden I get a hundred dollar leads, that's enormous. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, you know, there's all this other stuff that you guys do, which is what I said to you, um, you know, in a complimentary way, like you don't just offer a great product but you also provide the training and the coaching behind it, which is like the way to build a great business, right? Because you're not only just giving people something that works, but you're also saying here are valuable resources, you know, to use besides it. So there's a lot of other things. I wasn't even aware that you guys taught people how to do the SEO for free. Like I mentioned to you, I don't have time to do it. So I'm just going to pay you guys to do it. But, um, like for somebody that's just starting out brand new, I mean, Man, there's there's a lot of free stuff that you can that you can do. I mean, you you have to put in the work, but you can do it. So, yeah, I've been I've been really impressed not only with the, the conversion of your site, but just the company itself. Like, I think you're doing a great job, and I don't see anybody else doing it. So, um, it's really impressive. To be honest with you, some of the stuff that you do, I'm I'm looking at it like you know I get to start adding some of the stuff to my coaching business mm-hmm. because it's it's really impressive sweet dude dude yeah like so that that stuff makes me happy and it's kind of I, th- I think no matter what level of entrepreneur you are having some validation on all the work that you're doing what you're putting out is actually helping people and making a big difference well, is a big deal nobody nobody watches in the beginning right yep, yep. yep. <laughs> so so you you get the credit once you're successful, um, which is nice. I mean, it's nice to get the credit once you're successful. But if you're if you're a younger entrepreneur and you're busting your ass, like people people don't won't acknowledge it until you've got that awesome house and that you know you know eighty thousand dollar car, mm-hmm. which is unfortunate because like 
the work and the process and putting in the effort in the beginning is actually what really needs to be rewarded, yeah. you know, as an entrepreneur, because that's the point where you're like, man, I don't know if I, if I'm doing the right thing, is this working, whatever. And then all of a sudden, like once you've made it, people are telling you how great you are. And it's like, where were you, you know, six years ago when I was like thinking about taking a full time job? Yeah. Yeah, dude, that's funny. So what, one, one last question. Uh, we, we harp on ROI and that's exactly what your quote in the back uh, in your office is is about, right? Ultimately, the business that can spend the most acquire a customer wins because you focus on ROI. You focus on improving those things that continually inch up your ROI and your marketing spend on on closing more deals with the leads that you're getting. Uh, so you're investing, you know, what, 1200 bucks a year, whatever it is with Carrot. Um, what If you had to give a ballpark, dude, like what is that returning you? You're talking right. about on carrot? Yeah, just with that switch over to carrot. What, Ooh, what is that return? Man, you? I'd have to like do the math, but it's it would be insane because if you look at so I'm I'm not a usual case study only because mm-hmm. I spend so much money on marketing, oh, yeah. but but like how many leads did you say I got uh, in the past week? 116 or something? Yeah. Yeah. So say I got 50, I mean a lead's worth so so if I got half the leads and and they're worth a hundred bucks each. That's five grand a week, 20 grand a month, 240 a year, minus the 1,000 I pay. So I'm net positive 239,000. Dude, that's, that, huge. that's the That's the actual math for me. Mm-hmm. Of course, if someone's spending a little bit less, yeah, the, the ROI won't be the same, but it will still be good. Mm-hmm. And to, to, to try to do a website yourself, I mean, that's just like, and I'm paying a hundred, right? So yeah. you you guys even have a plan for fifty, right? Yep, yep. So I mean, um, I think the hundred includes all the training and stuff, right? Yeah, yep. Our weekly coaching calls, content marketing system, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, which is invaluable. But like, if you're on like an absolute nothing budget, you could still get it for fifty a month. And mm-hmm. yeah, you're not, you can't lose money on that. If you're doing mailers, if you're if you're doing PPC, if you're doing SEO, if no matter what you're doing, you need a website today. You everything's online. You know, like you said, um, it's not like a future thing. It is here. Um, people make fun of me all the time because everything I do is virtual now. Like people don't <laughs> see me. Like I'm in my office. Like the, I've got 150 agents. They never see me, but they see me on these things. Like yeah. I, I, and they're like, I never get to see you in person. I'm like, this is the world we live in, and it's only going further. I mean you know, we're going to be in virtual reality soon. And yeah. that's not even a joke. Yeah, dude, that's, oh man. Yeah, I, I definitely want to have you, have you come back and talk about team building yeah. and stuff like that because there's just so many great things you've done in your business. And I want to respect your time. And dude, so appreciate you coming on the Carrot Cast and sharing your story and sharing what's working and just being an open book. Um, and what I want everyone to do is, like I said, if you resonate with with uh, Tom or you want to look into what they're doing, head over to realestateinvestingiseasy.com. And uh, that's realestateinvestingiseasy.com. He's got a great podcast over there. Um, they've got great things that they're doing. And Tom, I just so appreciate you coming on here and being part of the Carrot community and uh, sharing your story. Yeah, it was good. Thank you for having me. For sure. Well, everyone, uh, go listen to this episode of the Carrot Cast. If you're on YouTube, go listen to it on, I- on iTunes and subscribe over there. If you're on iTunes, check out the video version. You can see Tom's office and his whiteboard and his quote back there and go check it out. And uh, guys, please go out there and really um, take to heart exactly what Tom mentioned. This this business is not, any business is not easy. You got to put in the work. You got to put in the work, the focus. You got to become a great marketer. But when you do those things and follow process and, and dive into the things that Tom mentioned, it increases your chance of success so much. So go follow Tom, realestateinvestingiseasy.com and uh, listen to other episodes of the Carrot Cast. Tom, thanks, man. Have an awesome rest Thank of the week. You. Thank you. Thank you.